Good morning and happy Easter to you. Today is a very special day as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. In the first century, the followers of Christ would greet each other in a very special way to remind themselves of the special bond they enjoyed not only with one another, but also with the Lord. That's what made their fellowship a very blessed privilege and possession. So as our Easter tradition has been, I would like for us to do the same thing this morning, even though we can't physically be here to exchange that greeting in person. So I will say, the Lord is risen. And then I'll ask you to respond at home with, he is risen indeed. Let's say that together, shall we? The Lord is risen. Amen. He's risen indeed, just as he said. It's our privilege and our joy today to celebrate our Savior's resurrection and in our Easter service, give him the honor and glory he deserves. Today, we celebrate the fact not only of our Savior's resurrection, but also the fact that Christ's atoning work was successfully completed. Today, every born-again child of God can enjoy the privileges of a full, free, and final salvation and every benefit and blessing that the gospel affords us. The resurrection of Christ is proof positive that the Father completely accepted and put his stamp of approval upon the life and death of our Savior. His atoning work satisfied the Father's demand for sin to be fully paid for and our reconciliation to be won between God and the offending sinner. So on this Easter Sunday, welcome to Foster Creek Baptist's online worship service. Due to the social distancing that continues during this coronavirus pandemic, unfortunately, we cannot have a worship service inside our church building, but we thank you very much for joining us online here today. We appreciate our church family and the regular attenders who are watching from their homes, and I want you to know that as your pastor, again, let me say I sincerely miss each one of you as I broadcast from an empty church auditorium. I look forward to the day that we can welcome each other in person and fellowship with one another again. Our church takes great delight in welcoming our guests who come, and our church door is always open to you as well as our hearts. And so today, if you're one of those guests worshiping with us online today, we welcome you to this new format and look forward to meeting you in person. I trust as we worship the Lord together today, that the Lord would indeed be exalted, that the Spirit of God would minister to our hearts in a very special way, would encourage you and help you take your next spiritual step for the Lord, and that the music and the message from God's Word will enrich your faith and feed your soul. But before we begin, let me make just a few quick announcements. One of the ways that you can stay in touch other than by phone or text is for you to connect with us on one of our social media platforms. Three of them are on this slide, and we welcome you to join us on any or all of these platforms. We also trust that you're doing well today and that your family is staying healthy. Know that I'm praying for you. If you have any needs during this time in which we are all staying home, please let us know. Each week, I plan to email a prayer sheet to our members and regular attenders. If you have a prayer request or an update to that request, Please send it along so that we can pass it along. And you'll note the contact information on the screen. Feel free to call us or email us. We're so thankful to all those who have so generously contributed to the ministry here during this time of quarantine. Your giving has been such a great blessing. And while we continue to be away from each other this month, please notice on the screen again two different options for you to send in your tithes and offerings. Your gifts are important in making sure that our missionaries receive their monthly support and the monthly bills for the church are being paid. Thank you again in advance for your gifts, whether they're done securely and easily through our church website, which you see on the screen, or by mailing it to the church address, which is also on the screen. We'll be checking the mailbox daily. For the benefit of our viewers, Let me say this time of year is an especially good time for us to saturate our thinking with God's truth through the medium of sacred music. 
Our church website has a resource that I trust you will take advantage of to help you in this regard. On the screen, notice that under the media tab on our site, fostercreekbaptist.org, you're going to find Abiding Radio. Click on that, and you will notice that there are four channels available in which we stream sacred music 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The seasonal channel is playing sacred music geared towards the Easter season. Listening to the instrumental channel is also a great way to relax at night or while working on your computer. For those times that you're not near a computer, there's an app for Abiding Radio that is free and you can download it onto your smartphone from your app store. You'll see the various radio channels there that are available. I've highlighted the channel labeled Seasonal so that you can enjoy the very same music being broadcast on our church's website. And I trust that will be a helpful resource to you. For our Easter service today, let's begin our worship of the Lord with a song that expresses the joy that's to be ours as we come to the Lord expressing our thanks for the resurrection of Christ. It's a distinctive that no other religious leader or founder has experienced yet nor duplicated. Our first three congregational hymns today are going to be accompanied by Will and Alicia Armstrong and Alicia's sister Lydia. We appreciate their ministry today in music. You'll see the words to these hymns on subsequent slides so that you can sing at home. But notice this screen. Matthew 28, verse 6, shares the good news the angel delivered to the ladies who came to the tomb at dawn on that Sunday. Notice the wording. The Bible says, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So based on this text, let's sing our first hymn together, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. singing that at home. Let's bow for a word of prayer together, shall we? 
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this very special day, this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We thank you that Christ is alive today and he ever lives to make intercession for us. We thank you for the scripture that tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that he's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. We thank you for the hope that this message gives us, for the transforming truth that continues to impact our lives and the lives of so many today. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to gather there in our homes, though we can't be here corporately. We ask your blessing upon each one as they are worshiping you today. Meet the needs of each who's going to be attending your services today. You know their special heart's needs. We ask your blessing upon the message that's presented in this music and from your scriptures. We ask your blessing upon Vice President Pence and his task force and all those who are fighting this and trying to manage this crisis in our country with the corona pandemic. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. We pray to give them wisdom, insight for good decision-making, that common sense would prevail. And we pray also for our scientists and medical professionals who are trying to find ways to effectively deal with this coronavirus. Give them the insight they need as well. We pray to keep our people safe and healthy during this time of sequester. We pray that we might be able to meet together soon. But today, as we worship you on this Lord's Day, we pray that you would accept our worship, accept our praise to you, and thank you for what you'll do to meet with us, minister to the heart's needs of each listener here today. Be exalted in our thinking and living. May we honor you this Lord's Day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Another one of the hymns we traditionally sing as a congregation on Easter is the time-honored hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And again, I invite you to sing at home as the words will be on the screen for you to follow along. today. I invite you to take your scriptures and would you open them please to the New Testament book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. For our scripture reading today, we want to look at verses 1 through 15 
as we read the historical account of our Lord's resurrection as recorded here in this gospel. Would you join me as I read this passage? Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 15. The Bible says, And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. If this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Another one of the hymns that we traditionally sing as a congregation on Easter is the time-honored hymn, He Lives. And again, the words will be on the screen for you to follow along as you sing there at home.
Our annual ministry theme this year is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, Behold your God. It's a wonderful, encouraging reminder that provides us with comfort and hope, especially during these uncertain times. It's also a reminder that when our minds get overwhelmed with the distressing circumstances of life, it's time to redirect our thinking upward and remind ourselves to measure every circumstance we face by what we know to be true about our God, and then live in the reality of that as we plan, prepare, and take our next responsible step forward. Last week, I introduced our new memory passage for the month of April, and this being the time we think of Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection, it's a great passage for us to memorize. So, right there in your home, would you recite this passage with me? Let's recite together the verse reference, the verses, and the verse reference with a good, strong voice. Ready? Psalm 118, 23, and 24. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ had a profound dynamic, and transformative impact upon the disciples of Christ in the first century church. No wonder they and the other New Testament writers kept the doctrine of Christ's bodily resurrection at the forefront, and it inspired them to evangelize and impact the lives of untold multitudes with the good news of Christ's gospel. They came to realize that Jesus' death would have been no different than any other religious leader, And it would have seemed a senseless tragedy apart from his resurrection because only a living Savior can save and genuinely offer eternal life. The resurrection of Christ is the cornerstone of the gospel message and its distinctive feature that gives it a superiority over any other religious message or claim. Additionally, Christ's resurrection opens up the way for born-again sinners to enter heaven and empowers them to fulfill their purpose on earth. God's word teaches us that we are to now live in keeping with who we are, ones who have been risen with Christ and alive from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is indeed a life-changing message as we embrace it and meditate upon it. So just before this morning's message, join me, if you would, in singing our next song that expresses this very thing that I've just shared with you. It's a song we've sung from time to time, The One Who Lives Again. When Christ arose, he turned the tide of human history. By dealing out a crushing blow to his arch enemy. For his risen glory, fiendish foes flee in dismay. Forever thrown into a state of helpless disarray. Praise the one who lives. Praise the one who lives again. Praise the one who lives again for seizing victory. Arose, he offered living hope to Adam's race by swallowing the sting of death and standing in our place, refusing to allow his holy one to see decay. Our God will make his own complete on resurrection day. Praise the world. Who proclaims these words for all to hear? 
your sinful self is crucified by resurrection power. Praise the one who lives. Praise the one who lives again. Praise the one who lives again for breaking every chain. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28. Earlier in our service, we read the first 15 verses of this chapter, so we won't take the time to reread it, but I do want to call your attention to verses 5, 6, and 7, as that will be the main part of our focus here this morning. Matthew, chapter 28, verse 5, 6, and 7. The Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. This morning I want to deliver a message from this text of Scripture that I'm entitling, The Message of the resurrection, the message of the resurrection. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord's blessing, and then we'll get right into his word here this morning. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we ask your blessing now upon this word that is your word, and may we, like the Thessalonian believers of so many centuries ago, that when they received the word, they received it not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God, which are able to effectually work in us who believe. So, Lord, we pray that you would meet the need of each who's listening here today. May your people be fed, may your people be challenged, and may we know the enrichment that comes from the Spirit's ministry in our hearts today. If there are any here listening that today are without Christ, religious, they've never been declared righteous and thus not qualified for heaven, we pray that today would be the day of their salvation. And we thank you for what you'll do as you accomplish the purpose you have in mind in sending forth your truth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The story is told of Neil Martin, a member of the British Parliament who ended his 24-year career there in 1983 as he was once giving a group of his constituents a guided tour of the House of Parliament. During the course of the visit, the group happened to meet Lord Hailsham, the then Lord Chancellor, wearing all the regalia of his office. Hailsham recognized Martin among the group, and he exclaimed, Neil! Well, not daring to question or disobey the command, the entire band of visitors promptly fell down to their knees. You know, sometimes our own efforts at communicating ideas can be misunderstood. People receive messages that were not our real intention when speaking. But when it comes to the great event of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, There is no mistake at all about its message. Our God communicates his truth loudly and clearly. Yet, many have tried and still try to twist it, change it, deny it, refute it. However, the fact of the matter is, God meant exactly what he said, and he said exactly what he meant. Our Lord clearly communicates the message he wants us to hear, understand, 
and to impact the way we live and the way we think. So on this Easter morning, I want us to come to a very well-known passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 28, and I want us to take a look this morning at the message of the resurrection. Any attempt to confuse, ignore, or outright reject the good news of Christ's resurrection from the tomb is to do so at one's own peril. So let's begin by asking the question, what is it about this message that we are to embrace and find in it great hope and blessing? Well, there are three things I want you to see about this message. First, I want you to notice it's first of all a message of inspiration. A message of inspiration. The Bible says in verse 5, fear not. In verse 6, he's not here, for he is risen. Notice that the concept of fear is mentioned five times in verses 4 through 10 in four direct statements, and then there's that one implied statement in verse 14 with the soldiers. In each case, except for verse 14, the same word is used repeatedly for fear. I found it interesting and fascinating that this expression, fear not, is the very same that was the message given to the shepherds in the fields near Bethlehem on the night Christ was born, his entrance into this world, the beginning of his physical life. The message in verse 5 is the same message given by the angel to the women on that pre-dawn morning, his exit from the tomb, the beginning of his resurrected life. My point in saying all that is this, what was true then in the first century, regardless of whether it was of a man or a woman, is true today in the 21st century. It's only human to fear the unusual, the abnormal, the supernatural, the things that we can't control. It's part of our human condition. Today, with the continuing threat of the coronavirus and the change that this pandemic has made to each of our lives, There are many who feel very vulnerable and experience the same intense emotion of fear. Many are afraid today because they are no longer employed. Maybe they just lost their job here this past week. They wonder how now they're going to make it financially. And as with the Roman guards in verse 14, there is a good bit of anxiety regarding their personal welfare and the security that comes as a result of experiencing things beyond their control and that they have never had to deal with. The Roman soldiers feared because they found themselves utterly powerless in the presence of God's heavenly soldier. And when we find ourselves utterly powerless to do anything about our circumstances, we are prone to express the same reaction they did. There are some who are afraid because they have serious health concerns. Others have had their future plans adversely affected, which have brought now other mounting concerns for which they have no answers and no way of controlling. You know, we don't like living life in a very unsettled state with no control over what's happening. But I want to encourage you this morning that regardless of what unsettling circumstances you're currently encountering that will tempt you to fear because you feel vulnerable to things beyond your control, remember this. A God who is wise enough to create me and the world I live in is also wise enough to watch out for me. Isaiah 44, verse 2, puts it this way, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. Yeshurun is a title of endearment for Israel that means upright one. So here's the point. God's grace endure, endears every born-again believer to God's loving heart. His love for you never changes in spite of the fact that your circumstances oftentimes do. In Isaiah 44, verse 21, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Isn't that wonderful? God never forgets you or abandons you. There's no need for us to fear the circumstances we're facing or the uncertain future ahead, whether it's the coronavirus and its impacts on your life or whatever else you might be facing. This past Tuesday afternoon, while I was in my office, 
quietly working on today's message, I was intently concentrating on what I was doing. My wife had just called me, and after our phone conversation, I placed the phone on my desk in between my laptop and my chest where I was seated at my desk. Well, the next thing I know, I about jumped out of my skin due to a very loud, obnoxious-sounding alarm coming from my phone. And as I looked down, there was an emergency alert that said in capital letters, Go home. Stay home. Travel only for work and essentials. Virus spreading in all South Carolina counties. Now, those last six words in particular, virus spreading in all South Carolina counties, would be especially disconcerting and would tempt all who received that message to perhaps respond with panic or fear. But again, may I encourage you with this. As I was thinking about that, this thought crossed my mind. Whenever our minds continually dwell upon the uncertainty of our circumstances, we will typically respond with fear or worry or have an agitated mind and spirit. And it's at times like this that we must redirect our thinking and our focus to the one who alone can conquer our fears and give us the ability to respond so that we don't have to do what the Roman soldiers did in verse 4, panic and pass out. The same angel whose presence created panic in the hearts and the minds of the Roman soldiers is the same messenger who instructs the women to stop fearing. But note the difference. The message that was relayed and the response given to it. And that message is recorded for us in verse 6. Notice, Christ is risen. Personally responding to the angelic declaration and embracing the message given created the response of joy and eagerness to do as they had been instructed. So, let's look at this message that was given that produced fear in those who were not prepared to accept it, and yet it motivated them to respond in joy. The message of the resurrection can inspire us today in spite of the threatening circumstances we experience as it did the women in Matthew 28, the ladies who were honored with being the very first to ever see the resurrected Christ. And again, here's my point. Once we receive the message of the resurrection and all that is communicated by it, there is no need to fear, no need to fear what we see or what lies before us or what lies beyond the grave. Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our own, as 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear. So the message of the resurrection is inspiring, first of all, because man cannot thwart God's plan. You'll see that brought out in verses 2 through 6. But I'm reminded of a verse in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. The Bible says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to 66. And then again in chapter 28, verse 4, verses 11 to 15. I found it fascinating that those who were most strict in adhering to the Jewish laws regarding the Sabbath day, were working hard on the Sabbath to secure Jesus' body inside that tomb so that the disciples could not steal it and claim he had risen from the dead. They wanted no stories circulating around either of Jesus' exit from the tomb or his body being seen again. But neither the powerful Jewish leaders nor the Roman soldiers could prevent the fulfillment of God's plans. Verse 2 tells us that there was... And it says here, literally in the original, mega seismos, a violent, severe earthquake that must have scared the Roman guards to death. Added to that fear was the appearance of the angel of the Lord, whom they watched single-handedly and easily rolling that stone away and then sitting upon it. That must have scared them out of their wits. My personal belief is that the angel rolled back the stone not to let Christ out but so people could look inside and see he had already emerged from the tomb. So here's the point. How futile are man's attempts to thwart the purposes of a sovereign God? Isaiah 14, 27 makes it very clear no one can annul the purpose of God. No one can move his hand or stay his hand from accomplishing what he wants. The soldiers here could not detain him. He arose just as he said he would. The religious leaders Plans to keep Christ inside failed. He came out. 
The best the enemies of Christ could do was to fabricate a lie and then bribe the soldiers to publish the lie that disciples came and stole Christ's body from the tomb while they were sleeping. But honestly, the truth was it was highly unlikely that Christ's body could have ever been stolen. For several reasons, quickly consider these with me. First, it was totally inconceivable that several men would have been able to roll back such a massive heavy stone away in front of armed guards without the guards being made aware of it. It was probably a noisy stone, as huge as it was. Probably the grunting of men who pushed it would have been heard. Would the soldiers have stood idly by to watch them as they attempted to move and then extract the body of Christ? Don't think so. Secondly, John chapter 20, verse 5 through 7, tells us that the burial cloths that Christ were wrapped in, was wrapped in, were laid in a perfect order where he had lain. If the body had been stolen, no one would have taken the time to unwrap the body of Christ and then fold those clothes, returning them exactly where they had been found, all the while Roman guards were outside. Third, Christ's disciples had fled in fear in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they were hiding three days later. Women who came to the tomb at dawn would not have been strong enough to roll away such a heavy stone, and armed guards certainly would not have allowed them to do so. Fourth, if the Roman guards had taken the body, all they would have had to have done was to produce that dead body to disprove the disciples' claims that he was alive and he had been risen from the grave. So that leaves us then with this. Either Christ was carried out of the tomb or he came out on his own. There's no other option. But then lastly, consider this as you study Matthew 28. About nothing else were the disciples so slow to accept and his enemies so quick to deny than the fact of Christ's resurrection. When it comes to fearful and uncertain circumstances, we can trust the sovereign plan and control of God. The message of the resurrection is inspiring because man cannot thwart the plan of God. But it's also inspiring, secondly, because God is always true to his word. Notice in verse 6, he is risen as he said. In John chapter 12, verses 22 to 23, Christ predicted his own coming crucifixion and death. In John chapter 2, verse 19, verses 21 to 22, Christ predicted his own burial and resurrection. In fact, the scripture says there that the disciples remembered he had said this unto them. Consider also all the Old Testament prophecies that had been fulfilled regarding the birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So my point is this, if God is true to his word about all those things, then anything else he claims and promises can also be relied upon as solid truth. You can bank on it. But thirdly, I want you to see this. It's inspiring because of what the resurrection shows. In verse 6, the latter part, notice, the angel said to the women, see the place where the Lord lay. You know, God accepted Jesus' sacrifice as full payment for sin. In verse 5, it said that he was crucified. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, verses 25 and 28, repeatedly the Bible says, Christ died once to obtain eternal redemption. That's all it took. One time. In John 19, verse 30, while on the cross, as he was just about to die, Jesus declared, it is finished. Nothing else needed to be done. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be subtracted from it. God accepted Jesus' sacrifice as full payment for, his sin, for our sins. And the proof of that was the resurrection. The angel told the women, come see the place where the Lord lay. He's not here anymore. Second thing is because there is life after death. In John chapter 11, verse 25, the Bible says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Earlier in the service, we sang a hymn that Matthew Bridges had wrote. He had written, crown him with many crowns. 
And in that song are these words, crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 and 13 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul argued that Christ's resurrection is proof positive. There is life after death. As his body came out of the grave, one day ours will as well. But then thirdly, I want you to see this. The resurrection shows there can be purpose and meaning to life. In verse 8, these ladies departed with great joy. They came with sadness, left with joy. The book of Acts reveals the power of the transformed lives of disciples and lay people as they too now had a new mission in life to declare the message of the resurrected Christ. So the good news today of Christ's resurrection is an inspiring message of hope because your life can be transformed just like countless numbers have been throughout time, just like the first century Christians were. The message of the resurrection is a message of inspiration. The message of the resurrection is a message also that gives hope for today and tomorrow. Secondly, I want you to see this. It's also a message of invitation a message of inspiration, and now, secondly, a message of invitation. Notice in verse 6, these words, Come, see. The soldiers were not looking for Christ while they were at the tomb. At that place, they felt the earthquake, and they saw the angel of the Lord, and horror and fear gripped their souls. The ladies came looking for Christ at the tomb. At that place, Though fearful of the angel's visit, yet the angel of peace, angel, the angelic message of peace and invitation was given. Come, see the empty place inside this tomb. How wonderful is the gospel invitation to everyone who would receive it. In essence, the message to you today is this. Come and see, discern the facts for yourself. All who come seeking Christ need never fear rejection nor that they are ever embarking upon a fool's errand. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death Unto life. In John 6 37, Jesus said, All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the Apostle John recorded this And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, Let him take the water of life freely. All those who have no regard and no desire for Christ will fear it one day as the Roman soldiers did because Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you personally received God's invitation to come to him, to embrace him and receive his gift of eternal life? The hymn writer Phrase it this way. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? The good news of Christ's resurrection is a message of inspiration. It's a message of invitation. And then lastly, this morning, I want you to see this. It's a message of instruction. A message of instruction. Notice verse 7 and verse 10. Go. Tell that he is risen. Verse 10, go tell my brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ today instructs us with the same assignment given to the ladies at that first century tomb. Go tell the good news that Christ is risen, verse 7. You will see him again, verse 7. 
God's word is reliable, only trust him. Verse 7 says, Behold, I have told you. Verse 9, Jesus met them and greeted them. You see, the good news we are to proclaim is called the gospel, which means good news. And that good news is given to us in summary form in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 3 through 4. The Apostle Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Would you notice back again in Matthew chapter 28, verse 8? For I find there is something fascinating. The reality of what these ladies saw and heard overcame any natural timidity or hesitancy on their part, especially given the first century cultural context where women were not considered reliable witnesses. And yet God honored them by not only making them the first to ever see the resurrected Christ, but to privilege them with carrying the good news to his disciples who were in hiding. God considered these women credible witnesses. Paul encouraged the younger pastor Timothy with these words from 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So let me ask you this question today. To whom will you go and tell the good news that Christ is risen and now offers eternal life and reconciliation with their creator? You might consider yourself timid, maybe like these women. Maybe you would say, I don't think that's my cup of tea. I'm just not good with that kind of thing. Well, may I encourage you that like these ladies, that when your heart is overwhelmed with the reality that Jesus lives and that he can transform your life, that joy will overcome any natural fear that you have. He's not giving you the spirit of fear, but as Paul told Timothy, he can empower you, help you express the love to others and sharing the gospel with them and give you the ability to think clearly. The great reformer Martin Luther wrote the following in his hymn, Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands for our offenses given, but now at God's right hand he stands and brings us life from heaven. Therefore, let us joyful be and sing to God right thankfully loud songs of hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then let us feast this joyful day on Christ, the bread of heaven. The word of grace hath purged away the old and evil leaven. Christ alone our souls will feed. He is our meat and drink indeed. Faith lives upon no other. Hallelujah. Many people today are in need of real hope and a sense of certainty and security in these uncertain times. There's much fear and panic due to the coronavirus pandemic. If you're born again through faith in Christ alone, by his grace alone, you have all the hope and confidence you need in Christ and his words. Your security is found in him alone. And though our times are uncertain, God and his promises never are. Can I encourage you with this parting truth? God's promises are always perfectly matched for your needs. So claim them, embrace them. One of the benefits of the gospel. The message of the resurrection is full of good news today that provides us with hope. It dissolves our doubts and calms our fears when it is embraced and meditated upon. And whether that fear is focused on what happens after you die or how you're going to face destabilizing present circumstances or maybe an unknown and uncertain future, the solution in each case is found in Christ alone. Corey Ten Boon once famously said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. The message of the resurrection is indeed a hope-filled, joy-filled message of inspiration, invitation, and instruction. Fear not, come see, go tell. Will you personally embrace and receive the hope that comes from this message today? On this Easter Sunday, what kind of reception will you give to the message of the resurrection? 
Our final song today was written and arranged by Bridget Chevy. The orchestration was directed by Dr. Tim Fisher of Faith Baptist in Taylor, South Carolina. And I believe it perfectly summarizes what we just saw from Matthew 28 as we considered the message of the resurrection. If you know the song, feel free to sing along or just listen closely to the words of this wonderful, challenging song, He is Risen.
God spoken to your heart today during the message from his word or perhaps through the music that you have listened to today? If there's a spiritual need that you have, would you contact us? You'll see the contact information on the screen. Our church phone number is there for you to call, and there's the email address in which you can reach me. We'd love to do what we can to help you and to encourage you to either establish a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or to develop it further. If you're one of our church members or regular attenders, you should have one of my either home phone or cell phone numbers. Please call me or text. If you're one of our guests tuning in today, again, we'd love to hear from you if there's a need on your heart. I want to say once again, Happy Easter to you. And I hope that today you'll have a fabulous day celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may the Lord bless you as you reflect today and as you rejoice in his resurrection, his completed saving work in your behalf. Let's bow for a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon these truths we've heard today. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your loving kindness to give us assurance in your word Your word is indeed the truth, and it has historically given to us the truth of Christ's birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection. And we thank you that he is distinct, he's superior, because he's God on earth. We thank you so much that there is only reconciliation through the blood of the cross. And we thank you that your stamp of approval was shown by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So, Lord, today... May we reflect upon this. May we be energized by this message. May we be inspired by it. May we be motivated to instruct others and to tell others the good news and to express our gratitude for your grace that way. There may be individuals listening today who need to receive the invitation to come personally to you and embrace you and receive your gift of eternal life. Grant that they would do so. Seal these truths to our hearts. We thank you for what you'll do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, I want to again say thank you for joining us online, and I look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday, Lord willing. So enjoy the rest of your Lord's Day, and again, happy Easter. Hope you have a wonderful week. Again, thank you for joining us online. The Lord bless you, keep you, and keep your loved ones safe and healthy. Have a great day.